G'day guys, welcome back to Both Sides of the Line. We are now at episode four, so we're uh, we're getting traction and we're moving forward, which is great. Uh, yes. again, once again, it's me and Aaron, but we've got two lovely ladies, two lovely guests in Cassie Gould and Ivana Brazilovic. Do I say that right this time? I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> it comes out different every day. I'll do my best, but uh, I'll put my hands up. <laughs> oh, God, the English language is hard, I tell you. I struggle in, in my own language. Um, guys, welcome. Um, as we'll jump in a minute, and the girls will have a bit of an intro to themselves, and we'll just start going down a path where we want, where we want to take this conversation. Basically, what we're going to do today is with a bit of content, we normally are raw and real. We are normally not really you know, going on down a scope, or we've got to follow a certain points of emphasis but today we want to really cover some key topics um we'll ask some questions we've got going not necessarily know the answers it doesn't matter how we answer them there's no right and wrong and at times we also may show a different view so for example uh, Cass might feel one way as might feel the other and i might just throw a curveball in and be a different voice and different version and it may not be truly how i feel it's just we're just trying to show different <coughs> perspectives and how we see how we can see things differently or take things the wrong way in that right Cass? and uh <laughs> That's a before the before the before the uh, segment, Jake. But anyway, love you. Um, so, all jokes aside, welcome, guys. Love being with you guys, and uh, hopefully that we get the viewers engaged and they actually get something out of it, especially the younger generation. So, hey, what are you thinking, Aaron? I'm thinking we have two really, really great up and coming athletes on Dazza. Um, episode four. Uh, so we keep ticking along. People still, still seem to be interested in what we have to say. Um, so I'm very interested to hear what Cass and Ivana come up with us for for today's uh, conversation. Yeah. Cass, how are you feeling? Yeah, I'm excited. I'm glad to be joining you guys today. Um, the first three episodes have been pretty awesome. So, yeah, it's pretty cool to be included oh, in this one. Thank you. Vans, how are you? No, I'm just I didn't happy to be here. Like, like Cass said, like I've seen the other three episodes and I love to see him. So I'm really excited. <laughs> All right, just for a bit of a brief, guys. Uh, I have regular chats with Aaron, but also have uh, a lot of connections with Cass and Ivana. Ivana's more in the recent couple of weeks. Uh, we just chat, bounce ideas, how they feel and how I'm feeling, what we're all going through and how we can try and navigate our way through the storms that we're in or the storms we've been in. Um, so we're not going into too much personal detail. It's more about the, you know, the things we think about every day through sport and sometimes in life itself and how they're all working together. So maybe we'll, we'll trigger it off as and we'll probably get a question underway and just see what these girls respond and then we'll just jump in and just try and you know, get our way around the answers and, and the questions. What do you think? Yeah, it sounds like a good idea, Daz. Let's kick it off. All right, girls, mm. or, or it doesn't matter, there's no order of merit. Um, so we'll just go with it. So first question we want to know is, is what makes you enjoy the sport, but also what could also take away the enjoyment within the sport that you play? It's a good question. Um, I think for me, like I'm a very team orientated sport kind of player. Like most of the sports I played at school, like all through, obviously I played basketball all the way through, but all the kind of different sports I've played, I love the team atmosphere. And when there's like a culture and a group of people that like, become a family like in that setting and I think that's what keeps me in sport because I love social interaction I love just being around people and having fun and like getting to express things like your competitiveness and stuff in a in an environment that is like welcoming of that but then to answer the second part like where that kind of falls off is when that environment isn't um inclusive or it isn't welcoming of personal differences and all that kind of stuff and it isn't and it doesn't cultivate that competitiveness i think that's kind of when it tips the other direction but yeah for me just like finding the joy of being around people and doing like working hard at something and seeing your um seeing the like effort you're putting pay off i guess kind of that's a good response we uh it's good a lot i like both sides of it's good well yeah. both sides of the line. there you go works yeah, out well yeah. exactly yeah well, um, for me, it's like it's just expressing myself on the court. I think that's what I love about it most, especially like doing it with teammates. I think um, just the joy of it, like the competitive nature, and just being a leader on the court as well as like whatever you do on the court can sort of become reflective of what you do outside of the court as a, as you are as a person and how you treat people. And that's kind of the biggest thing with basketball is just that team atmosphere, like Cassidy said. But where it drops off is like the pressure that you might put on yourself or what, what you think other people might be putting on you. And also like you as an athlete, you want to like make goals for yourself so you can succeed and see like 
yourself improve, but it's kind of drops off when you feel like you haven't gotten there yet. So it's amazing with responses. And sorry, as I jump to you, is yeah. is it normally we'd think that other other things would be the reasons why we lose enjoyment, but we could be our our own reason why we lose enjoyment on how we see, how we think about, and how we overthink, um, how we compare, how we worry, how we raise. We should talk about all those things. So. Love both responses. It just gives us so much to talk about today. As yes, what about you, mate? What makes you enjoy and not enjoy? You know, you're a coach, uh, a player. So, as a generic part of basketball, the theme. What What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, look, I guess I'll, I'll talk about it from a coach's perspective. Uh, and I obviously, people will know me. I coach at a rep level only at this stage. Uh, so, uh, the thing that I get enjoyment out of is seeing uh, my players develop and learn to learn the game. Uh, I want to see them enjoy the game that they obviously have signed up to play, play in and love, uh, you know, every time we're together. Um, but the other thing that I uh, take great pride in, I think I may have touched on this in an interview before, is developing them as people as well. I think um, the great thing about sport and we talk about basketball in general is you generally have a team that could be 10 to 12 people. Um Athletes, and I think the the if there's so many sort of learnings that are tangible to the sport that you can take with you outside or, or past your basketball journey um, or along it, and then past it once it's for, sort of finished in life. Um, and I think one of the things that uh, I see from a coach's perspective now is uh, you know you generally have the routine and the structure of it all when you come together, you practice. Um, when I say structure, it's more or less based around the routine side of things. And um, I think that's really great that you can sort of take those sort of skills with you later on in life um, because that way you can sort of navigate yourself through. It could be difficult times or, you know, new, new environments and things like that. When you, after your playing career, you can start to adapt and uh, take with you into your, your working life as well. Um, so, um, yeah, back to back to what I think. It's hugely about making sure, uh, you know, the players enjoy themselves uh, and that we create a culture uh, that's full of learning and enjoyment at the end of the day. Because uh, the last thing that coaches want to feel like they're responsible for is squashing enjoyment out of it. Absolutely. Yeah. So with enjoyment and losing enjoyment, so we you know the enjoyment is what we like talking about and, you know, we, we should have a passion of what we play, what we play, and you know, what's all we're involved in the sport. Unless you've been made to play the sport, but when you two girls are at, I'm a lot of it's about choice now. Expectations. How much can that impact the way you enjoy the sport? Whether you enjoy it or you don't, because you two, behind the scenes, we've talked about expectations on how we set expectations, but then we raise the bar and we don't get to enjoy the goals we, we reach. We sort of bypass that field. We think, oh, we're getting there, so I'm going to reach another goal. And we just sort of bypass, and we don't really get to enjoy and, and, and enjoy the moment that we achieve each goal step by step. We're always trying to you know, reach for higher and higher expectations and higher goals. Does that sometimes take away the enjoyment when you set the bar too high or you don't get to actually enjoy each goal you set? Does that make sense, girls? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think, and we have kind of talked about this before and it probably sets it up, but there's like two probably kinds of expectation. Well, there's probably more, but like in terms of what we're talking about, like the expectation you put on yourself and then perceive expectation from others. And I think I can probably talk more about the expectation of myself. And I think from a young age, like from my juniors and stuff, like reflecting on it now, I can talk about the fact that I probably set myself expectations that were not impossible, just like unrealistic and I didn't give myself any leeway so then that um created a domino effect into that frustration and um like the basketball court was a time when I had to be perfect I had to be this and I like you know built all these things on myself because of my expectations but it wasn't as much expectations people put on me it was just ones that I had created because I wanted to achieve things I wanted to like I had like I said like I had my goals I had this and I wanted to do this and all this stuff but I was so hard on myself that um yeah it kind of it does create this like I think it did affect uh, over time it affects your performance because like um like it create there is a connection between the mental side and the physical side so I think like things like getting hesitating or like tensing up on the court and those kind of things are probably products of um like 
at like obviously I'm not a psychologist, but like products of just being like so um, fixated in doing everything perfect or fixating and like I have to do this and those kind of things. And I think like for me, like if you ask me like when I was a junior player or even like a couple of years ago, like as a junior player, I had no idea that I had myself such high expectations. People might tell me like, oh, you don't have to be perfect, you don't have to do this, whatever. But like I didn't understand what that meant. Then probably a couple of years ago I could say that I could see it. Like I'm like, yeah, I'm hard on myself, but I had no idea what to do about it. I had no idea what. And I think now I can like look on it and be like, yeah, that's creating this. So like that's, you know, kind of where you need to fix it or like talk about it. And like once you reflect on it and like say it out loud, like you can't hold yourself to perfection or to these expectations that are impossible. And like you got to let yourself, like that's when for me when I play my best is when I'm just like, you know, just play, playing like I did when I was 12 before I started putting all the expect expectations on myself. So, like, that side I can kind of talk about, but I don't know. I've only probably talked about the other side or, you know. <laughs> hey, Brian, before we jump to you, can I just, yeah. just talk about something with Cass? Yep, what's up? The thing about Cass is I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask the same, same thing, but we'll go a bit up and then I will jump in. I know you personally, Cass. I've seen you since you're that 10-year-old girl through mm -hmm. domestic and we've talked about this. How, not only does it affect your performance, how much does that impact you as a person or personally? Um, you have to yeah, go the, just touch, you know, just where you want to go with that. But uh, how much does it, does it, does it tell you apart knowing that you, you sit in all these high bars and you get there, you don't really get to enjoy it and you're so focused and you, and you, and you forget what you've just, I've just, I've just achieved that. And you're sort of coming and going. Does it, does it, does it impact you personally? Yeah, I think it does. I think a lot of, for me and like a Bavana's probably the same and a lot of other junior players, like if once you like choose basketball, like that's your sport, like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, there is that kind of sense of identity, not completely, but like I'm a basketball, I'm this and that kind of stuff. So when, um, not, I don't want to say like, but when that kind of like expectation and a lot of other things that like, in my case, you may have created yourself kind of like, I think of it as like a cloud kind of covers like what you, the sunshine that first brought you into basketball, but once that cloud kind of covers, it's hard to separate that from other stuff in your life because like all oh, for juniors, all you do, you go to school, you play basketball, you hang out with your friends. Like it's a part of like your everyday life. It becomes not so much who you are, but like what you're about. And so I think, yeah, it does to some respect. It can affect both sides. Thank you. Thank you for your true <laughs> Love it. How do we thoughts on all that? Sorry, was that me? Um, so I guess the one thing you touched on was uh, enjoy. We were sort of honing around the enjoyment side of things here, um, and probably something to Ivana and Cass is: Do you feel like um, as players, because we're always striving to push and improve, and the perception of going to the next level? Around uh, my question is: Do you feel like you have the opportunity, or do you create the opportunities for yourselves to? I guess for sit back, albeit briefly maybe, and just reflect on some of the success and enjoyment that you've had. Probably I'll ask Ivana mm. to kick this one off. Um, I think briefly, especially going through juniors, I don't think I ever took a time to reflect because I've always mm. felt it wasn't enough. Yeah. And that's sort of like, that goes back to the perceived pressure I put on myself based on what I think I think about me. That's when I was sitting in dad's office and I was reflecting on my accomplishments as much as, you know, how many there were and, you know, VC and state and, and all these sorts of things for me, it wasn't enough. And I think that that was a bad reflection. It was like a negative sort of thing. So especially going through juniors, I never really reflected for some reason. And it, yeah. it pretty like as I went and sort of tore me apart and that's why I had to set all these goals and, and expectations that just like Cass said, weren't realistic. Yeah, yeah. How about you, Cass? Um, yeah, I don't. I also don't think I ever really reflected on it. And if I did, I think it was like more of just say, for example, like making a team. Like if I didn't make a team, that was a negative reflection. But if I did or I achieved something, it wasn't positive. It was just what I was meant to do, you know. So it like became like a like everything was based on so everything I was achieving. Like the enjoyments kind of slows out because I just think like, yeah, I'm a basketball player. I'm trying to achieve these things. This is like I'm ticking boxes, but really like I should be reflecting and be like, damn, that was like a good job. Like you did this. You like you have fun doing it. You like that's what you wanted to achieve. And, yeah, I think for me I didn't reflect much as a junior player, even yeah. until recently. 
Yeah, yeah, and I think there's probably something, Daz, and uh, we may have spoken about this before, Daz, uh, is, uh, and uh, we don't we don't expect everyone to sort of sit down and then sort of reflect on their successes. I mean, something, some, a lot of that can come as uh, players start to mature. You probably see that around once they reach the age of 16, 17, 18, when basketball's really starting to turn towards that serious level if you want to go down the, uh, you know, pursuing the professional athlete sort of line there. But I think um, the the fact uh, that, and I think Cass, you said it before, around being perfect. Um, maybe this is something that's starting to creep in the sport. Um, a, a lot of uh, recently successful sort of sport teams touch on embracing the imperfections um, and understanding that not every game or performance has to be perfect. If they can rely on people perhaps playing their roles um, and just enjoying about going enjoy going about doing what they do. Um, that's something that's starting to become a lot more uh, common and a, and a theme across sports now. Do you feel as though as young athletes, you two, that uh, this this sense of perfectionism, do you think it's driven more or less by outside influences and the way you may compare yourself to others? Um, I mean, no doubt you both possibly got access to social media, things like that. Uh, you're pretty connected you, you probably have uh, lots of players that you connect with as well, not just within your team but across the sport. Um, do you feel as though there's it's more or less external factors that probably drive that that thought of perfectionism or is it more self-driven? Um, I think that some of it is – I think there's like two sides. Of it. Like I think some yeah. of it is – down to who you are as a person because mm. not everyone might have that instinct to be a perfectionist. So some people are a lot better at just being like, hey, like, and moving on from things. But then there is that, like, for sure there is comparison going on. No matter Every time you step on the court, like, I, I don't know if that's just me or for, like, I think just generally, like, talking to people, a lot of people are always, um, yeah, like, this person did this or this person did this. And then, like, yeah, social media and everything, I think, plays a role in it and but like to what extent like uh, no one will ever know but mm. um yeah I think like trying to differentiate between um what is like innately in you and what has been caused by external factors or what has been like like cultivated from that I'm like I find it really difficult to split up I think it's all like just like it comes and goes I don't know yeah yeah what do you think Ivana um, because I think it depends. Like I think, like Cassidy said, some people can be self-driven, and other mm. people get sort of that inspiration or or the competitive nature from seeing somebody else succeed. And that sort of that definitely dri drives the per the perfection aspect of it. Like when you see somebody who's your age, who you know might be at the AIS, or who you feel like is very successful in their area, when you guys are the same age, that kind of wants you to get up in the morning and strive to be better as a player, and and always work on you know your weaknesses and things like that. So for me, I think it's always been um, maybe, like, but there's been days where you kind of where I've thought of not thought about people and kind of like what do I want? Like what? How do I want to become a player? In sort of what sense do I want to become great than I was yesterday? So I think, like Cassidy said, you can't, you can separate them, but it, it, like at the end of the day, they feel like they're both one sort of thing. This is where it gets very, very hard as a player. Yes. You go in an interview. So if I'm sitting there asking the questions, I already know the person is wanting to answer what I want to hear. So I'm not doing the interview for, they're not doing the interview for them, they're doing the interview for me, which doesn't make sense. I'm looking for the person to work with them. So when you're playing a game of basketball, there's two choices that you got to, you have to battle with, which is I think goes next one, which causes the anxiety and doubt. Do I play the way I know how to play, or do I worry about how they how I think they want me to play? Because it becomes very very mixed on what I do and don't do. Yes, the coach has expectations on you and what your role should be, but you've also got to be part of your natural self, which is what your natural game is. Is why you've been chosen to be part partake in that team. That's all you've been chosen. If you're trying out for tryouts, you're not a team yet. So you're playing for what you think the coach wants and what your parents think the coach wants and what you think the you know the program wants, or should you show the best version of you so they get to see who you truly are? And I think that's where it gets lost. Another question is who are we playing for? Are we playing for us? Are we playing for someone else? Mm -hmm. Then we 
you start to create the anxiety, the doubt, the the you know what you said before, passion about fact. Is it an illusion or is it fact? What people think, what they don't think. I presume Aaron is thinking something right now. Does that mean I've judged him for what I think he thinks? Yet he hasn't even said it. You know, so that's that's how that's how we get so complicated, which really gets to me and sees kids break down in piece by piece. When it's a simple game. It creates a level of anxiety, doesn't it, Daz, before you've even stepped out on the court in a lot of senses. That's what we sort of find. Is that what we're sort of saying here? We're creating a level of anxiety around perceptions, my own performance, and just starting to carry a bit of weight and heavy burden around that. Oh, brilliant. Like, I mean, we all know the car ride home for some. You know, mm. they're so worried about getting the car to get the expectations from mum and dad. I mean, I'm not judging mum and dads. We all do our role differently. I'm not the perfect dad. I'm not the perfect role model, but I do the best I can, and I, and I think I help my kids the best way I can. Doesn't matter if it's right or wrong, but there is ways that we – there's expectations from somewhere else. We've gone through expectations. We haven't asked about the anxiety and doubt, which probably the next question is. Mm. Is saying that – of does that make sense what you said, girls? Is do you – and I know you girls have felt it, so go into detail as much as you want and don't go into detail as much as you want if it starts to impact you. Anxiety and doubt. How much has that had played a major role in your in within the sport that you're supposed to love and enjoy? Anxiety and doubt. Has that has that shown itself while you've been developing throughout the years? A lot, a lot. I think, especially uh, domestic didn't really matter, but as soon as I got into rep and, and state, and you sort of you go into a gym that has like forty kids in it. The anxiety is not really there, but it's the doubt. And like, because there's only 10 kids going into a team, you kind of like wonder, it, are you good enough? Whatever your grader, is it enough for the coaches to realize? And especially going through like juniors and every Friday night games, the anxiety is there because for me, it's the perceived pressure. And it's like, well, instead of me walking into a Friday night game, wanting to, w I mean, the wanting to win is there, the competitive nature is there, but it's the back of my mind is like, okay, don't make a mistake. Don't lose this game. Don't turn it over. And it's always that the anxiety, just that that's what controlled the game for me. It wasn't all the the hard work I've put in and like being able to read the defense. It's just the the trigger of, hey, don't make a bad pass. And that sort of affected the offense and the defense of it. And the doubt just has been through. The doubt's always sort of, how do I put it? It's it's kind. It just hurts your mental health completely. You just like as much as as much like work you can put in and. And all the hours you spend working on your craft, the moment I felt like I stepped into a tryout or a state tryout or whatever it was, the doubt of not being good enough has always, like, it's never left. And as much as you can be competitive and, and play against the best people in the state, you still feel like you're not good enough. And that has completely just tore apart my whole junior basketball career. And now that I look back on it, especially now during Corona, it's just I think of why I wasted my time doubting myself when who knows what I could have, could have achieved when I didn't have that perceived pressure of, on myself. Sorry, Cass, we're going to go in a minute and Daz jump in, whatever. Mm. I'm going to ask you two girls and then Cass, you can just jump in when you answer it. Mm -hmm. When we're so not good enough to make the team of 10, we agree? Mum and Dad's, oh, my kid's better, but that kid, that kid should have made it. Hang on, the coach's view is different to someone else's view. What the coach is looking for is what the coach is looking for. I may have 10 great guards, but I can't take 10 great guards. You might be the fourth best player, but I can't take you because of your role that I can't fit into the structure of this group. So just because you didn't make the 10 doesn't mean you weren't one of the best. It doesn't mean you weren't good enough. I could I could pick five state teams right now and they could all beat each other up. Different players, different roles. You know, it doesn't matter. The question I'm going to – the example I want the viewers to hear now, Cassie Gould and Avant, I'm pretty confident you both got recalled back up sometime. Got what, sir? Called up, which means you didn't make – the mm. team originally, yep. Cap, at a very high, at the highest level. Vana at the second highest level, because we're talking about state. Cass. So did you get called back up, going back to Vana and then Cash, you jump on with mm. the, the anxiety thing and go into the call-up part. So Vana, did you get called back up to the state team? Yeah, so last year for under 20s, um, I got cut and I didn't really think about it much, but it was, it was kind of depressing for me. And and then I think um, somebody got injured and so I just had to step up. And I got called up um, by the coach and she's like, do you want to come and play? And I had 24 hours to sort of make a decision. And so I wanted to, I was like, okay, instead of me sort of whining about not making it in the first place, I wanted to take the opportunity, like have it and take the opportunity that I was given. So I could prove myself. And finally, I felt like I worked hard enough to be recognized, to be picked. 
But the thing was, as much as it was a positive thing and I went to Canberra and I enjoyed it and, you know, we won a couple games, lost a couple, I still felt like when I reflected before the tournament, I was like, well, I wasn't good enough in the first place. And all these negative thoughts started to come in like, oh, I didn't make the first 10. Why was I picked? Why was I a 12th option? And even though you're part of the team, you still sort of felt like you weren't because you weren't picked in the first place. And that sort of, yeah, at the start of the tournament, that affected me. But then I became comfortable in my position. And so we ended up winning and becoming more comfortable as a team as the tournament went on. That's understandable with your feelings. And we get that and we support that. This is where it gets so crazy in lost in translation. You got caught up. Yeah. All the kids that were cut, uh, the hundreds of kids that they're trying in the under-20s and the, you know, the best in the strongest league in Australia. Everyone wants to play Victoria. You got caught up. But yeah. we look at that as a negative. Yes, I know you found it as a positive, but you would have, in that 24 hours, for 23 hours, you would have gone, oh, I wasn't good enough. I don't want to play. This. It's pride. I don't want to do this. You would have been going through your head up and down. You wouldn't have slept. I know. And Cass were doing the same thing. You got caught up. That tells me you were always in the mix. They just mm. On the right balance to fit you all in a 10. And that's sometimes you've got to realize that the jersey, the representative singlet has ruined it all for us. You're guaranteed to play rep. You try out, you'll make the 10th side. You'll make the ninth side. You're guaranteed a jersey. We lost, we lost what it was like to actually earn and be rewarded and understand where you stand in the basketball world. Does that make sense? Because it's like it's God given right. I'm not against um, not giving away. Fourth ribbons, fifth place ribbons, sixth place ribbons, participation ribbons, participation medals. I'm not against that, so I'm going to be very careful what I say here. But we did lose the merit of what we're trying to strive for to really appreciate the common goal we've achieved. Does that sort of make sense? Yeah. Cass. Sorry, Aaron. So Cass. No, Cass, yeah, Cass, yeah. Got, Cass got a call up. So Cass, can we talk about your anxiety and doubt where it comes from? And then can you please reflect on when you got caught up and how it felt and blah, blah, blah. Please. Sure. Um. Uh, I guess quickly touching on that first bit, um, I think for me it all comes back to the stuff I put on myself and, um, like, I expect myself – like, I think that there's a role that exists for me in a team and so I put myself in that and I have to do what I can to fulfil that role and then, like, if I do anything outside of that role, it's like, I don't know, I doubt myself. Like, I think it all – I don't know, it's hard to explain because it's so interconnected and once you start talking about it and reflecting like we're talking about, you realise how much like it's what you think the coach thinks of you, what you think your teammates think of you, how you think you should play in the team, how like and what you've played in previous teams and all that kind of stuff and I think that just cultivates something. But once you like talk about I think the best games, like I remember a coach last season asking me, um, like I had a really good game and it was after a string of like clear hesit- games where like I was hesitating to shoot. I was like a bunch of stuff because I just, even though I practiced, like even though I worked on my craft outside, I doubted my ability every time I caught the ball. And then I had this one game where I just like shot the ball. I let loose. I like kind of had a great game and my coach was like, what? Like why? Like, and I was like, I don't know. I like literally didn't think about it. I didn't like, that was the solution. I didn't think I just went out there and, I, if I was to do it, like, I don't know how to not think, but it just happened. And I was just like, <laughs> this is the one game where I just like, literally just was like, stuff like, let's just, let's just play. Like we have to win. Let's, I'll give it all. And I don't know what different, what my prep was different, what this, I don't know what happened, but like, it showed me that like, if I can find out how to do that more consistently, like that is the key for me to, you know, enjoy it more and play, play who, play more true to myself. Um, and then on the call-up thing, I guess. So the first example is um, so the Oceana team, um, You like I got an email saying, like, you're one of the two people, like we have 12, we only take 10, but you're in the two that if, like, other people make a higher team, then you'll get pulled up. So I was the like, people, oh. It's the people, no, that's the Australian team, right? What did you say? Viewers know that's for the Australian team, right? Yeah, the yeah, Australian for the Oceania Championship, which is like the stepping stone to Asia Cup, which is like the stepping stone to World. So it's just like the small tournament start. But um, yeah, so you get told that too. You're like, oh, sweet, like you know, awesome. I'm like, well, I'm in the Australian team, but I'm like in that too. That's like, if people get pulled up, then you'll represent. I think that example, like I spent similar to Ivana saying, like you spend the whole time like people might not think it but you think people think that like you're the person who got pulled up like you're the 10th man like you know you sit on the bench like you know you're 10th man like you don't play in the game and you're like 
I'm the 10th man, whatever. And it wasn't until the last game of that tournament that I was like, why don't I embrace this? Like, and just, you know, like be the best tower ever on the bench, be the best, like whatever I can do, which I think I do pretty well naturally, but like I was kind of, yeah, you get stuck in that, like, I'm like, you want to obviously be not the 10th man, like who wants to be the 10th man realistically, but like you just get stuck in this until I was like, yeah, I might not even step on the court this game, but like I've earned this, like, yes, I'm the 12th person that was in the squad, but like I've earned the right to be sitting on this bench, being at this game, like being part of this team to win a grand championship. Like that's amazing. And I don't think until I think so 20s, the next year I had the same thing. I was an emergency got pulled up like at the last minute. And I think the only reason why that was one of the best tournaments I've ever played. And like, I did not feel like a 10th man the whole time. Like I, like I felt a part of the team and I felt everything was because the coach instilled in me, like as like when she called me up to say like you're part of the team, she was like, I want you in this team. Like you're my first pick. You're like my fifth, like, you know what I mean? She's like, no matter that you're like being called up because someone, again, someone has like achieved something higher that's made them not be able to be in this tournament that I didn't feel like, like I feel like I felt like I deserved to be there and the result of it was like I think I had a pretty good tournament and like we won the championship and it was and I felt like I was a big part of it so like yeah I think like that's two examples of how it can be like negatively impact how you feel about the game and like the anxiety and doubt it create and like if you just let it go not so much let it go but like it's part on you and part on the coach and your team to make you feel like you are yeah you are like I don't know what the word is like you're a big part of the team like your your presence is valued let's go with that yeah that's great i, I think uh Dazza, I'll, I'll just jump in here um it's amazing the mindset shift that you both covered in your experiences um from being that oh i'm not quite sure if i'm accepted into well i'm just going to make the most of it and then all of a sudden you felt like you were just contributing and you're playing well and you're in your element which is fantastic to sort of see but do you guys sort of see the journey in how your mindset shifted and how that sort of related to your performance can you sort of establish that right now you sort of see that um yeah i think so like yeah like just between those two examples, like I think there was probably a year and a half maybe. Yeah. And I've always told myself like if you get like I've always had it stuck in my head, like if you get cut from a team, like it's not like 10 people go to the tournament and they're the 10 best people or 12 or whatever the thing is. They're the best 10 people in that moment and who the coach thinks is going to win them a championship. And it's not like it doesn't mean that you're like those – 12 people are on a pedestal compared to you like you're it's just like time and place and this and like that's the nature of the game we play so mm. I think yeah definitely for me there was a big mind shift between those one and a half years or I don't even know how long it was and then even till now I think just being able to see like if you ask me at that set at that 20s tournament like whether I was like being different as the 10th man compared to what I was at the other time, I probably wouldn't have said there was any difference. But, like, seeing it now, I, there was definitely some unconscious mind shift between those two, depending. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know why. I don't know what caused it, but, yeah, between yeah. those two times. Yeah. How about you, Ivana? Yeah, I think because I'd, I'd tried out and I'd, I'd um, gone to, like, East Middle under, from 16s to 18s to, like, till 20s. And I think that, you know, being cut all the time from 16s and 18s and finally getting the chance under 20s, like it does it stays in your head a bit like that you're still not good enough and all that but i think at the end of the tournament you can see that even like for a week your mindset changes because as the games went on through that throughout the tournament i stopped thinking too much and like cassidy said like there's a game where you just don't think but you don't know how you didn't think yeah. like at all, at all during the game and stuff so yeah yeah there's been a big shift like for cass it's been a year and a half but i think for me the biggest change was that one week at the ais just playing and then, because at first it was like, okay, am I, I'm not good enough. I got called up. I'm like Cassie said, I'm the 10th man and stuff. But then by the end of the tournament, I became a starter and I became the sixth man. And then it kind of feeds on your confidence a bit. And then I had games where, you know, one game became very tight against Queensland and I ended up racking up seven threes and we won by two in the end. It was kind of like, those, those games that you have that build on your confidence it helps me help me reflect even after that one week. So, yeah. So that's great. Mm. Go down. It's amazing, right? Your mindset shift is amazing. I'm, the, I'm probably the luckiest guy around because I get to see you two personally. I get to see the mindset shift changed outside of, 
you know, off the court, on the court. Cass, you know, in, in, in the last six weeks, the transformation has been amazing. Lana, just in a week from a comp, not, not from just me seeing it personally, I get to see it. I'm not just hearing it. I'm seeing the facts in place. You got to be proud of yourself, girl, because if people actually listen, isn't really divulge into your message and what you're saying and how we're saying, it should have a massive positive impact to see things differently from a different perspective. And the most important person is you. I mean, if you keep doing what you want to do and what you strive to do, then the notice will come. And the word getting cut, I don't know if it's the right word, but it is the word to use. You, you got cut, but well, maybe you just weren't ready yet, or maybe you weren't for the right fit. Doesn't mean you got cut. Doesn't mean you weren't good enough. It just wasn't the right fit for that formula. And there's a lot of forms we're trying to create. So the question I'm going to ask you girls is, even though your mindset shift change has been very positive, there's still a theme that I'm, I'm missing here. When are you good enough? Because you're still striving. And Cass, you're going third year into Dave's and College, Div 1 College, a unique college, a, a pretty well-respected college. You're a captain of the college. Vani, you're 18. You're still playing virtually at the highest level possible for your age and with the, you've been in the state team and you've had some injuries, so there's a bit of hiccups there. I mean, there are some opportunities to climb. College is going to be a talking point soon, whether it be sooner or later. So are you girls going to be ever going to be happy with what you're doing now? Are you good enough? I want to know, do you believe that you are good enough for where, where you're at right now and do you accept it? Do you embrace it? And do you truly appreciate it? That's a fair question, and I want your honest answer. <laughs> That's so unfair. <laughs> well, okay, so. <laughs> then why is about the change again? <laughs> like, yes, I'm happy where I'm at right now. And, like, to say that out loud is, like. Hard? Like, I don't think any, yeah, yeah, it's hard because, like, obviously, like, I've, it's taken a lot for me to say like, yeah, I'm good enough to where like to be where I am now. I'm like happy with what I've achieved and like it's been awesome and it's all been worth it. But like the like you're li like I don't know if everyone's like I'm lying if I say that like that um, is how I always think or how I like like there is times where you think like yeah, was it all worth it? I'm prob like if I've done if I had done X Y and C like would I have been somewhere else? Like could I? be better if I did this or like, like, I yes. Took, if, I took, if I took the shot. What did you say? Sorry. If I took the shots given. Yeah. Like I do think about that and it's like, but I like, that's, I think for me now, like that's in the past, like that's how I thought in the past and like whether that was the right mindset to be in, whether that was, whether that brought out the best in me or like whatever, like it's in the past. I can't go back and be like, Oh yeah, I should have taken those 10 shots that I passed off or like, and there's no defense in front of you, like just play basketball. Like, I, like of course, I wanted to, I want to change that, but like, you can't. You have to accept that. Learn. For, if I can, the biggest thing is that if I can learn from that and change that to how I am now, well, to like future, then I think that's successful for me. But like, I think now I've realized that like, yeah, I am good enough to to be where I am now. I'm like, yeah, I'm happy playing. But, oh, it's not like we're playing at the moment, but. <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> right, good Sorry to throw that one in. I was just trying to mix up your mindset a little bit and have a bit of fun with you, Cass, but she's going to hit me later. But <laughs> I'm glad she says the country thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I couldn't tell you. I mean, before, probably last year, after the, after the 20s tournament, I did feel like I was I was happy with where I was at until the injury. And that sort of put my mind into perspective because I had worked so hard to, to not get injured and to avoid things like that because I had, you know, college offers and I had everything sort of on the table for me and I felt confident and happy with myself for where I was at. And then as soon as I got injured, it became like a very depressive mindset. And then I couldn't, I couldn't tell you now that I was happy with where I'm at because I am ticking off these goals and I'm achieving them and I feel great, you know, like with the rehabilitation and stuff, but I still feel like back of my mind, I'm not where I want to be at right now. So there's been days where, okay, I'm, I'm happy with where I'm at. I'm good enough. But then you kind of, I sit back and I realize, well, I'm still injured and there's still things that I can't do. So am I actually still good enough? So I couldn't okay. really tell you. But I want to throw a question in that, so I'm going to add it to you. Yeah, so well done. I like the way you just covered that because I was, I was waiting just to throw something at you. 
Okay. Why is an injury made you doubt whether you're good enough? It's an injury. Your injury will heal. You'll go through the rehab and the process and procedures. You'll do as much as you can to prevent that from happening again. But again, some 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 injuries you can't prevent. It's just I, I land on someone's ankle. I, I, I misjudge my landing. That's they're preventing things you just can't cover. Yeah, you can do muscle strength and conditioning. You can do all the right things, but some things are just instant. They happen. How does that change the weight that you're good enough? I I, maybe I'm just being debative now and being that that devil. I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, just no, I, yeah. You were prior to their injury. You just haven't got back on court because you're not fully recovered yet, but that will come. Why would you be different from the person you were to the person you're going to be because of an injury? Well, this is the thing. The way I've always seen it is that is this way. Like, I've before I got injured, I was here with everybody. That's what it felt like. Well, maybe like it just depends. But now being injured, it feels feels like you're like three steps behind somebody else. And that sort of it it like when I come back from this injury, it means okay, I have to work five times as hard as anybody else. I wake up earlier, but that it motivates me. That it's not just. And as a player, it physically motivates me, gets me up out of bed in the morning, makes me go for a run, and just just to improve something, like work on my weaknesses. But then when I go to bed and I'm reflecting and, and mentally putting myself in a position to, to you know, think about it all the time, I still feel like everyone's still five steps ahead of me. And this – It was three, now it's five. You're kicking. You're yeah. Yeah, I- <laughs> 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 hey, Ivana, can I, and Aaron, jump in whenever. I, I, I want to have this debate because I love her. And I think she knows where I'm heading with this. And Cass, I will do exactly the same with you because you know who I'm, what I'm like. Mm-hmm. Avana, I'm going to have to make you realise something. You yeah. might have missed the news and you might have slept through it, but we're in COVID-19. No one's playing. So you are not falling from three steps behind to now five steps behind because in the last six months, I'm pretty confident no one's getting traction on the development. No one's doing much more than what you're already doing because we don't have accessibility to the venues. You're doing the same as everyone else can do. They're all restricted and no one's playing game situation or real-time training. So I love you. Now, if you were talking to, to me about this last year or year before, I get your argument or I get your conversation. We're in COVID-19. So guess what? If you're going to do an injury or recover from injury, I'm going to say it's the best time because you're not losing much steps behind the players. You think that you'll – does that make sense or was I a bit wrong on that one? No, no, you're right on that one, yeah. Just, Just sometimes it goes, it goes, yeah. <laughs> I think the other thing as well, Daz, in uh, thinking about Ivana here coming back from such a significant injury is um, she's uh, – and Ivana, you, you can correct me if I may be off base here. You're going through something where it's absolutely – testing your mental capacity to train your mindset right now and and uh, get through something that's obviously it's going to take time to maybe mentally get over but you're training that mind muscle of yours and they say that obviously um, for athletes 20 percent is the physical 80 percent is the, med- the the mental so you're probably uh, the way again i haven't been through a significant injury like you have but you're you're winning the mental battle ahead of maybe some of your uh, peers that you probably might be coming up against over the next few years. You've been through something quite significant. You're in the middle of COVID nineteen. Uh, you're in the road to road through rehabilitation, but that ability to train your 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 mental and capacity in that mind muscle right now is probably you know three or four five steps ahead. Of your peers, have you th- have you started to sort of see it that way? Maybe uh, sometimes I think because I sort of see it because I've have talked to a lot of people based on like my mental health, so dad, parents, yeah. and people school and and my family and stuff like that. So I feel like there's times where I do think about it, and I mm. feel like I'm in a good place mentally that I'm focusing on it more than my physical side mm. of things. I used to always think about it, mm. um, but yeah, I mean sometimes. I think because I've always felt like basketball was always this physical journey. It was always like who was quicker, who was a better shooter, who was more athletic. But now when as you get older and you see how much your mental side really, really influences the way you play, that's when it kind of puts it all into perspective. So uh, mentally, yeah, like you said, I do feel like I have um, might be a step ahead of my peers and stuff with the mental side of things. I think I've just always like focused on the physical things. So mm, Yeah, uh, great. Good, well, it was a massive learning curve in that little segment then. Well yeah. done to all involved. Well done, yeah. <laughs> hey, I, I just want to touch on something that Cass mentioned uh, uh, before around um, uh, you were, what, the 12th person, Cass. 
Mm-hmm. And then uh, you had a conversation with your coach around when you got called up mm-hmm. and they sort of outlined to you, look, you're a you're really valued sort of member of the team. This is probably the role that I see you playing. This is the fit, blah, blah, blah. How much did, how much did that help you? That conversation with your coach, the message that you got from your coach, how much did that set you at ease or sort of lift any sort of weight or burden or doubt off your off your off of your shoulders? Um, I think it played a massive role because like mm. for a coach to like in previous times when I've been cold. Yeah. So in the first example was when I was yeah. um the twelfth man, it was like I think it was an email. Or it might have been mm. a coffee. I don't know. It was like not. It was like the way that things have already been done. But in the second example with the twenties, um, that I'd probably say. I think I was. I was the first. I don't know how many emergencies got pulled up. That it might have. It actually might have just been me. So I might have been eleventh in that one. But when a coach calls you and says, like, obviously what one girl's achieved is awesome, and like, obviously won't be available for the tournament. But like, I'm so excited to have you on the team. Like, for them to show that, like, if they could have, like, it's like the thing of, like, it's not they had a team of 10 and they just, like, tacked on a couple of people that, like, you know what I mean? It was like it was like the whole time I was part of this team that was 11 people. But, like, it just happened that, like, you know what I mean? Like, there was only 10 that could go. But I still felt like, like, we hadn't even trained yet before this, like, before I got co- told that I was part of the team. Like, we hadn't, we didn't do any, like, um training stuff before that so I never really like did that thing like where you train as an emergency which is like I think is a very tough position because it's always like if you're playing five and five in a drill and it's like you know what I mean like the five and the five and the emergencies are the first sub so there's like always this like you know when you think of who is who so like obviously I didn't have that experience in that setting but the coach did play a massive role in it because yeah just saying like that like they're excited to have me they really wanted to have me that was like stoked that like yeah i'm like i wasn't the same position as the girl that got um that like wasn't able to play the tournament but Mm. yeah i just she really instilled in me that like she was excited and thought that like she could make i don't know like i was like a different like he was saying about before about formulas like if you were to look on a piece of paper i would not be the replacement like in no world would i have been that like the sub in for it but she was excited to somehow create this new formula that had me in a part of it and like I was going to be I wasn't just gonna I'm not just tacked on the ends like we are all part of this big group and that is something like I was saying right at the start is like if coaches can it's coaches and players but coaches can cultivate an environment that values every single member no matter what their role is like it everyone shines and I think that obviously it's so hard to do because people humans are so complex and it's just like impossible to get it right all the time but I think striving towards that environment where everyone is included everyone feels valued um everyone is a part of something bigger it's not just about your two main scorers it's not just about the coach it's not just about this that is when like you see the best in athletes and like that's what brings back the joy that you had when you were like I don't know five or six and picking up a ball for the first time yeah how about yourself, Ivana, just with your progression there, like you said, you were sort of called up, you were, uh, you thought you were the 10th person, you made it to the sixth man sort of role, you were starting, and then all of a sudden you, you're nailing seven triples in a massively important game. Was there some messaging around that from the coach um, through that journey? Well, like, for example, before the tournament, because I got called up two weeks before the tournament, Yeah, and someone else got into the game. Another person got called up, and it was kind of a really rough pre-tournament sort of time. And I didn't really necessarily have a like a talk with the coach like like Cass did, but it was mainly I think because we had lost the first three games of the tournament, and it became really rusty. And and then the, uh, us as teammates, we weren't really kind of connecting because six of us it was our first time at nationals. Four of the girls had already played on numerous occasions, so everyone was really stressed and stuff. And I think. It was halfway in that Queensland game that was the next game after our losses that um, my coach, she, we had a timeout and she said, said to me, she's like, shoot the ball. Because I had been so hesitant. And like I'd, I'd hit a couple, but I still felt like it wasn't enough because we were down by 20. 
And she was like, just keep shooting the ball. And that was, it wasn't a 10 minute talk of why I was supposed to be on that team. She just trusted me. Like she said one sentence and that's all I had to sort of like to kind of, you know, turn on that switch of, okay, I'm just going to shoot some threes. Yeah. And it wasn't, it, it wasn't something that had to be so like significant, like a huge talk, but yeah, even something so small kind of makes a huge difference. And that sort of paved way throughout the other games as we went on. I mean, we didn't grab a medal in the end, but the last few games, we, we won them all and by like a lot. So as much as it helped, I mean, it really did help, but it wasn't at the start of the tournament. It was halfway during it. And I I sort of, I felt like I really needed the reassurance. I don't know if it would have been different if I got at the start of the tournament, because I felt very um, like very stuck because I was always trying to live up to coaches' expectations or I felt like I wasn't good enough. But then halfway in the tournament, that kind of, that one sentence really helped, and I think I really needed it to to go on. So yeah, yeah. Make the difference when the coach is informative, engaging. And as long as you know where you stand by your coach, it makes a difference. It's when the ones who don't understand their role, where they're at, and where they sit, because that lack of connection, or that lack of information, or that lack of communication, is where half the problem is. Why teams struggle? You might have the best players going around, you might have the best coach, but you don't have that communication, or they engage with each other and understand with each other. I don't think it'll work. Um, hey, we're at 51 minutes, guys. <laughs> we go for another four hours, to be fair. Yeah. Um, this may person, I want there's a question I want to ask if that's all right is selfishness. I like Casco first, there's a reason why they're second. As, as a coach, you know what you think. What do you think I mean, Cass, and then Ivana? And then, as a coach, what do you think I mean by there are two types of selfish players? Um, I think there is so, like, the probably the first people think of when they think of selfish, which is like um, someone who like intentionally doesn't like, I just sound basketball court because I've talked about basketball. Yeah, someone who basketball. intentionally doesn't share the ball or someone who is all about like the, the winners on them. It's all about them. It's like, you know what I mean? Like that kind of self-centered egotist. I don't know if that's right. Nature, yeah. that kind of thing. But then I think over time I've learned the other side of being selfish because I think, Naturally, as a player, like I've pride myself on being a facilitator and like that kind of teammate and like always like no one wants to be perceived as being that kind of first kind of selfish. Like that is for me has always been something that I worry about, like that if someone, a coach or someone thinks of me as that kind of selfish. And I think that spiraled into like kind of like two ends of the spectrum. Like I thought I was so selfless that I was becoming selfish because I was people getting you like getting me for example people getting me open on a court to shoot the ball or people creating for me or something and then I was passing off shots which inherently becomes selfish because you're all about worrying about what you look like to other people rather than fulfilling your role in the team which might be at that point is to shoot the ball and I think learning that if your role on the team is to shoot 25 shots that's not in no regard is that being selfish that's pretty much being selfless because that's your role in the team. Like, and I think for me, switching like what my traditional definition of selfish is helps me not perceive myself in terms of like I have to be so selfless because I don't want anyone thinking that I'm this, which turns into the other end of the spectrum being selfish. The reason why I said oh, you'll be next is, and as are, we will do stat sheets next week, maybe with the, money, the movie The Money Ball and all that stuff. Because <laughs> you tried to treat me last week about baseball and I got sidetracked. But <laughs> And Kat, that might be a conversation we had. And, and me and Kat, we're just having a conversation about how we read a stat sheet. You know, you only take the two shots, but then someone else taking more shots now, which now we're putting a heavy burden on another part of the offense. If we can't have the even spread and the equal opportunity to corrupt you for all, we're actually not realizing we've probably been selfish by not taking an opportunity that's given every single time because that's why it's been given. That's why it's been created. And the more times you don't take that, that opportunity, it's going to hurt the offense, it's going to hurt the structure, but it's also going to make the opposition – make your scout reports even easier. Would that sort of make sense in a, in a brief summary? Um, and me and Cass had a great chat about that, and I thought it was amazing how I see it, she sees it from different viewpoints, and how we sort of – we could see it from a, from a different perspective. Would you say it's true, Cass, how we how we saw those those stat sheets? Yeah. Week? yeah. Um, Ivana, what are your thoughts on what we mean by there are two types of selfishness? And I, and I don't mean one's good, one's bad. I'm just It's just the word I'm using that's probably easiest to, to use. Yeah, I mean, Kaz pretty much summed it up really well. Um, I just felt like 
with the two selfishness, she's she's the facilitator. I felt like I've I've always the one that was selfish, like in the sense of taking the shot. And so, th- like the teams that I've played with, um, especially when I played at Diamond Valley, I've always been the shooter. So I've always been the one that you know a play was written for me to shoot a three or you know, it's like a last second shot or something like that. So I've always felt like I was always comfortable in that position, and. I mean, like my teammates knew where to find me and, and there's some games where they couldn't or I couldn't make a shot and I felt that was selfish because I couldn't make a shot, but it was my position to play. And the other games where I would, I don't know, shoot up like 15 shots, I would have whatever, 25 points, I couldn't care. But at the end of the day, if we won, if we lost, if I felt I played a good game, made all my shots, I would still feel selfish because I felt like it wasn't a team sport. Because my teammates weren't the ones shooting the shots, but they were the ones giving me the ball. So when you think of Bars, we think, okay, the assists, the rebounds, the shots, and it is a team game. But I've always wondered, like, why I was the one taking all the shots, and I put all this pressure on myself, and I felt like I was always the worst player on the team because I felt I was selfish. I don't know if that makes sense. but right. it makes no, sense. No. So that's think- kind of, Yeah, that's where... Yeah, Kaz, you yeah, got it. We go on to that, like... I think changing the traditional definition of selfish because like for me, like I felt that if I did become that player who shot all the shots that I was selfish, but really I admired that in myself that someone could be so confident to do, like I didn't see that as selfish. I see that as selfless because you're fulfilling your role and you don't care. Like to me on the outside, like I think someone who shoots all the shots doesn't care. Like they're just like, I'm playing, I'm not thinking about it. I'm going at it. You know what I mean? And like that I admire, but I'm, I was so worried about being that people thought I was selfish, but then I reflected like, I don't think that's person selfish. So why am I worrying about if they think I'm selfish if I did the exact same thing? So I think like realizing that like one, not everyone thinks the same way you do. And two, that like changing that definition of selfish. It's like for me, like I would never think that that person, like you taking on the shots, if that's your role, if your role in the team is taking those shots, like to me that's selfless because you're playing your role in the team. But then, like, reflecting on it, like, I thought if I did that, I would be selfish, which is so backwards. And it's so it's such a messed up way of thinking. But I think if you look at, like, how how you would see a player that's, like, exactly like you, that's taking the shots and, you know, doing exactly what they do, like, if you look at that person, like, you don't think they're selfish, but, like, you have that reflection on yourself. So I think, like, once you, yeah, trying to change that definition of, like, the traditional idea of selfish, then it helps you, like, I don't know, be more free in the way you play. That's just that's- if you're open, you're open, if you're open, you're open, if you're open twenty times, you're open twenty times. Yeah, if you're shooting with a couple of people. It's literally you, so simple, and I don't it, know why I make it so complex. Yeah, <laughs> more of a cheat, though, mate. You're being stubborn because you're not passing to an open player on the back on the on the weak side of the backcountry cut. You're not giving to them because you're getting triple yeah. teamed. I get that. If you're open twenty times, that's why you train the offense to get open to take the shot. I, I yeah. think as a mm. is there such thing, and I'm just making this up. Is there such thing as two sides of selfish when it comes to coaching? Um, oh, gee, you put me on the spot. Play. Look, the part where I uh, I feel selfish as a coach is uh, probably spending time away from the family um, and being head down and involved with the game uh, in prepping for practice, prepping for games. Um, I think there's no doubt times where I feel selfish because my focus is purely on that. Um, so you're not sort of present for family time or probably family focused at those times. So that's where I, I do feel selfish because you, you do, you spend time away from your family um, at practice, at games and then traveling to and from. Um, but at the same time, look, that's a requirement as a coach and that's a sacrifice that you make a little bit. And I'm fortunate enough to have an incredibly supportive family that understand that for me. So that makes that a little bit easier. Um, but it's something that I am conscious of as a coach, um, if that answers your question, Daz. Yeah, probably. And I'll look from another perspective yeah. where I could be coaching game day and I'm worried yeah. about where else, how everyone else wants me to coach. Yeah. Yeah. They, they want yeah. to the yeah. play. So I might yeah. get to on a certain system, but it doesn't work within my style of coaching. Yeah. So I wonder whether – where am I being selfish? Am I being too much worried about where everyone else does so I don't coach where I want to coach or do I show yeah. co- where I should coach, which I do best? Like I don't mm-hmm. – my family tells myself because I don't really prep for games very well. I shock up and coach. But game day is I know that I'm going to coach why I need to coach, get the best out of these players. Yeah, I, look, at mm, – sorry. Makes sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So look, I think uh, when I started out on my coaching journey, um, that played on my mind a little bit. I think as I've 
sort of progressed over the last couple of years in particular. Um, I've worried a lot less around what the outside perception sort of is. Um, again, I've probably become a little more comfortable and more understanding of what type of coach I am um, and my philosophy around why I coach and how I do teach the game. Um, and again, uh, that's a conscious decision I've made is just having a small circle that I'll trust and confide in and seek the opinions of people um, who I think uh, understand me, but also perhaps understand the game as well. So, yeah, I get what you're saying, Daz, uh, but I think that's how I sort of navigate through your question there. Are we part of your trust family? You I'm are, sure. mate. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Ivana right. and Kat, definitely. <laughs> hey, um, we're gonna get we're gonna get asked a question. We all must answer it. We'll go to Kat's uh, as all, and then maybe I'll, I'll should answer. I suppose I've got to be accountable for the questions. Yeah. So Cass and then Ivana as uh, me. So Cass, what's been the biggest thing that's held you back to being the best version of you? Myself. Can you give me a little bit of a thumbnail? that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, well, you got that. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm sorry. If you'd like to elaborate a little bit, don't have to go into too much detail, but mm -hmm. can you give the viewers a bit of an understanding? What do you, what do you mean by yourself? Because it can be generic. It can be an easy way to say myself, but we don't actually pinpoint the concerns or, or what we need to do to try and change that to become a better version of ourselves. What do you mean by that? Um, so I think like we were talking about before how kind of everything's interconnected in terms of external and internal factors, that kind of thing. But so like, obviously I don't know completely where expectations were grown from, like where that kind of stuff all happened or, you know, who knows. But I think that for me, like if talking about reflecting on things, I think where, um, like, in ter like, if you just look at the simple art of, like, not taking a sh hesitating when they're taking a shot, like, I always bring it back to that. Like, it's me. I'm the one who's catching the ball and shooting it, right? So I think, like, the fact that I had been so stuck in my ways, like, no matter where the, like, what caused it, internal, external factors, like, situation, environment, whatever, like, it was me. It was me, the one who was, like, catching the ball and like shooting the shot so i think the person like the thing or the person whatever holding me back was myself or is myself but i don't like i'm not saying that like i'm the problem like that's not what i mean like like i don't know does that make sense yeah because no, it's what is Cass? whether it doesn't make sense this is what people just sort of forget the fact that you're trying to explain it, the fact that it's not so easy mm -hmm. to, to navigate it that's yeah. a process in itself and people don't get we all expect this generic easy answer. Oh, you know, I set a goal. I feel great. Well, no, you now got to go work hard for that goal. Now, mm -hmm. we do the generic easy, easy opt out. If I answer the question, I've ticked my box, I move on. Just yeah. the fact you're trying to, that's that's a greatness in itself. Whether yeah. it makes sense to me, Aaron, or if it doesn't, well, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You're trying to make sense of it, which means it's working for you because you're thinking about it. Yeah. That's also, as a positive. Would you agree? Yeah. That didn't make sense. I had no idea what you said. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea what I was saying. I didn't work on that. You're just like, this is literally nowhere. But yeah. Uh, I, 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 I should have stuck with a simple one word answer. That would have been so much better. <laughs> <laughs> I, love it. I love seeing how people try and, and get across. And it's not such an easy thing to do. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, well done, Cass, for trying. Good job. <laughs> Ivana, can you be a little bit more simple? No, I'm joking. Can you have a go? No? Here we go. <laughs> Don't worry, you'll top that easy. Put <laughs> two words together and you'll be my. <laughs> yeah, she'll say yes and no. There's three words. There were stuff. <laughs> what told you back? The best version of you, man. Uh, I would like same thing with Cass. It's myself and, and the perceived pressure that I put on myself based on what I think other people are thinking about me. That's like, because I think, you know, I can put in all the work and train and feel good about myself during the day and wake up and, and be hungry for more. But it's always at the back of my mind, I'm the one thinking that somebody else is expecting more of me. And that's like, it might not be true at all. I don't know who's talking. Someone might not, might be, someone might not be. But that, that holds me back more than anything. And it just con completely destroys the self-confidence that I have and, and the self-esteem that I have and causes all this doubt and anxiety that we were talking about. So, like I said, it's myself holding me back because it's what I'm perceiving. Good answer. Well done. You're doing well, guys. Actually, wait, I have something. There you go. Now, Kathy. <laughs> I think I can't work out with it. I think for me, like, 
Avon, help me understand. <laughs> I think so for me, yeah, that's why you two are working together. That's great. That's it. <laughs> I think it's for me. It's more like it is myself, but that's kind of broad. It's more the fact that like I didn't. I for so long I like um. I was naive to the mental side of sport, and I was so adamant that it was all about the physical side and that like all the expectation stuff is just something that comes with it and it wasn't something that I could change or learn about like that's just who I was I'm a perfectionist on this and like I think that the fact that I wasn't willing to reflect or willing to talk about um the more could, like obviously this is a much more complex part of the game but me not being willing to talk about that or like understand that and being so set in my ways is probably what helped me back well yeah done. I don't I'm proud you went back. Yes, good job. <laughs> I knew what you're. I knew what you're saying. But just, that's just good how you actually you rethought it. And normally you just you, that's your edge and you move on. You, this is a whole good change. I'm saying all you. So it's a great job. As what's holding you back? Uh look, I'll uh, echo Ivana and Cassie. It's always first and foremost, probably yourself. I'm my own harshest critic. Um, that's for sure. Um, I'll uh, probably sit back and analyze myself to the nth degree um and that's sometimes a good thing because you you can discover things about yourself and ways that things that make you tick things that don't make you tick um so having that ability to reflect is great sometimes but uh yeah you, you won't meet a harsher critic than your own self i think so i think for me it's just learning around how to sort of just temper temper that off a little bit um and I guess uh, one thing that's helped me through that is just seeking a little bit of outside clarity as well from those who know me. Um, and I think that's helped me along over the journey, particularly the last couple of years. Wow. How about yourself, Darren? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> oh, you can't say, I don't know. You've put us all under the hammer now, mate. Come on. Now it's time, time for you to step up to the plate using a baseball analogy there. Yes. Yes, this is my, this is my answer. <laughs> um, I, I think my issue, and I, I, I think I teach a lot, which I, I, do, I, I don't fulfill myself enough. So I don't, so I'll set targets and goals, but I don't, it doesn't fulfill me. I always want to try and do more and more, which then ends up being a flaw in itself. And a lot of that's due to my past. A lot of to that is, I'll say it out loud, is my mental health, which will always be a battle every day. So I know that's what caused it. So I'm aware of it. Uh, I don't deal with it. I learn to cope with it, but I don't really have much of a choice. Mean, this is about choice. I could choose to be better, but I also don't have much of a choice because my past does always come back to bite me on the backside and you can't change the past. And I'm not going to ignore the past because it's what's defined my future and what I've done with the transition. So my problem is I don't get enough satisfaction because I think I should be doing so much more because of what happened in the past. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's mm. – Basically, going to be my downfall to the day I die. So, mm. but I'll, I'll keep going and moving forward to making a difference and make an impact. But I think I'll make more of an impact for others and less for myself. And that's probably going to be the biggest flaw. Yeah. Selfless, that make sense? selfless, mate. Yeah, now that does make sense. Uh, we've gone for four hours, 67 minutes, and <laughs> seconds. No, so. we've got to let Cass pack, mate. Yeah, yeah. Cass, just say, Cass, uh, we haven't, mate. Do we know when you're going home? Oh, going back to America, sorry. <laughs> Okay, you are home. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, um, yes. Is there a salary you can't say yet? No, I'm leaving tomorrow. Oh, what a surprise. Are you on tomorrow? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell no one's between us. All right, well, we wish you all the best. <laughs> yeah. Uh, stay safe, stay well, have a safe flight. We know you've got some good company with you on that flight from other colleges, but from Australia, mm -hmm. so enjoy that. Ivana, thank you for jumping on board. But thank you, girls. You've, you've been true and honest, and hopefully the viewers have actually seen we use the word vulnerability as raised the other week. So thank you. Appreciate you. But the change in you two in itself has been truly amazing just to fit and get on here and talk openly and so easily as you have done, which you wouldn't have done in the past. So we want to thank you for, for being a part of that. Uh, as what have you got to say? And the girls can say what they want to say to finish off. What are your thoughts, Ed? Uh, look, great to have Cass and Ivana on and opening up. It's difficult to do. Um, so I take my, I tip my hat off to you guys. Um, and I'm sure we'll have you on again in a couple more episodes in the future because I think we've raised some really good things around the mindset in particular. And it was great to actually see, um, and I'm sure when you watch this back, is the start of the conversation and when we started deep diving into your thoughts and the emotions and the mindset sort of stuff, you can actually really see the growth and the change. So um, well done and thanks for coming on.
Uh, before we go to the girls, an allergy I just picked up on. We're also oh, going to realize you ain't wearing a hat, so you cannot tip your hat. Can you explain that analogy? I'll tip my hat. To you. You tip my hat. Yeah, that is. That's good. We're having an allergy week, and that's one of them. Oh no! I don't wear a hat, mate. What does my head? In? Uh, yeah. <laughs> nice one. Nice one. Uh, I'll think. I'm thinking of baseball where they all wear hats and stuff. Oh yeah. uh, well, lucky it is what it is. That's, what, that's, what, that's another analogy that we hate talking about. It is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Dale. We're not right. in here. Cass, any thoughts? Anything you want to say? Anything you feel? Anything at all you want to say before we sign off? Um, yeah, I guess just like obviously thanks guys for having us on and um, yeah, it's been awesome to also hear it from another player that's like obviously me and Ivana aren't the exact same age but like we've been through similar programs and stuff and it's like awesome to feel that like not that you're not the only one because I know a lot of people go through a bunch of different stuff and like their careers take different paths and that but it's like awesome to that there is kind of this movement at the moment to like be reflective of things obviously in a time where we have a lot of time to think but yeah do a lot of reflection just talk about and i think you guys are creating an awesome platform for people to obviously express your opinions like no like nothing's right or wrong and that kind of thing but just to like talk about the things that you know for so long everyone's just like put to the side and like focused on you know but yeah Good job. thank you yes. um i'm just really glad to be on here be open and it's be like to talk to Cass as well about it like some who I've played against to to sort of see what she thinks and and realize that players a lot of players feel feel this way and I wasn't the only one so it's kind of really reassuring and yeah I just want to thank you guys for having me on here and to see what you guys think and and for me to express myself I really appreciate it and we appreciate you girls right. um absolutely just some quickly for the viewers something coming up um Cass hopefully we'll stick to this agreement we haven't written the end yet <laughs> So just so you know, Kath is about to fly uh, back to home, uh, back to Davidson College tomorrow. She's got a, a massive process just to get there, especially with all the safety precautions, all the rulings of COVID-19. And then she's got to go into isolations, which she'll be by herself for 14 days, which is part of the uh, the rules and regulations. So for Kath, it's not going to be easy. It wouldn't be for easy anyone who had to go through that process, especially if you're a up and going, always active type of person. So what we're going to see if Cass will do for us is over th every three-day cycle, she's going to clip parts of the day on how she's feeling, what she's going through, what it's like. Just the real-life experience of an athlete going to the tra transition, good word, transitioning from back to where she was to back to where she's going and how she's got to transition back into what we call the different normal for now. We don't know if it's going to be the real normal, the true normal, or just a part-time normal. Mm -hmm. And then what we'll do is we'll up, uh, upload – bit of what's going on and then we'll sit down with her in a zoom maybe on this one whatever platform i'll talk as and we'll get a bit chat hey guys how are you traveling how are you feeling and we might have a bit of fun with it you know we might see you know she can cook for us and do a live cooking <laughs> session cassie gould at davidson Open college or something. i don't know we'll have nothing we're gonna have a baker thon we're gonna have hey we should play um pictionary or something. i don't know we'll play a game we'll play some board game whatever so a bit of fun cat are you gonna agree, agree with this or you will talk <laughs> you said it on this platform to make sure that I do it. I know it. Yeah, you <laughs> put her on the hook here, doesn't huh? yes, oh, yes, no yes, yes, yes or no answer. Yes or no. Yes. Yes. Okay. So we'll uh, look after that. Watch that, and it's going to be fun. Um, as a, as always, happy with you. Love you and the girls. We think the world of you, and we love you dearly. Um, and we wish you nothing but uh, good things moving forward. But stay well, stay safe. That's the main things right now. And just if you struggle, that's anyone and everyone. Reach out to someone. You are not a burden. No matter what we're all going through, we need to share it um, so we can help each other. If I'm going through something tough, I'll still prepare to help someone else and vice versa to others. Um, happy that, as girls? Happy that? Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to shut down now. Girls, stay on for us and as stay on. So we'll, chat, we'll jump off the live um, yeah. and we'll debrief. I know Cass got a pack so, and um, get her YouTubing skills up to scratch and then we'll go from there. All right, guys. Sounds good. Take care. Much love to all. Stay safe. Stay well. Stay strong. See you guys. Bye.